Hi, I introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Nicola Linhardt and I work for the Social Reactor Organization in Brno, Czech Republic. Uh, the platform called uh, Social Reactor was originally designed by Architecture Studio Koga uh, as a tool for solving the problem of uh, inactive urban structure, commonly known as uh, brownfields, and their adaptation in uh, something uh, useful for the city, for the residents and the uh, entrepreneurs in an environmentally friendly and sustainable way. Uh, because as uh, architects, uh, we are uh, responsible for a sustainable approach in projects uh, that will be here for decades or uh, even hundreds of years after us. Uh, so the project Social Reactor has uh, resulted in the creation of uh, two multifunctional creative centers called uh, the Distillery and the uh, Lithium, and also uh, annual festival Brno Design Days. Uh, thanks to our V4 partners, which are Creative Industry Košice from Slovakia and Association of uh, Polish Architects uh, from Poznan, we uh, could invite, uh, invite our guest today. Uh, and together we are going to look at the topic uh, which we call the nature and productivity which tries to follow some uh, of uh, the questions as the relationship between uh, enclosed space and other space, the relation between control, controlled environment and nature, the manifestation of uh, the return of men to the nature through the space in which we live or our daily lives at home, at uh, work, uh, in the urban spaces, and also the influence that the nature has uh, on our thinking and productivity. So the first uh, speaker is uh, co-founder and uh, designer in Koga Studio, which is uh, one of the winners of this uh, year's uh, Vanguard Design Awards, uh, Alexandra Georgescu. Hi there. I hear the clapping, even if I don't hear it. Um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you, Nikki, for inviting me and for pulling me out of the beautiful Italian Mediterranean uh, sea that I was in right now. This is why the hair and the slight burn that I'm just noticing right now on the screen. Uh, but I would like to share a little bit um, about us. And then I put together some pictures that I'm going to talk uh, over. Um, uh, we have a really... Uh, cool and funky new website, which is talking a little bit about uh, who we are. We are um, working on various uh, fields. That's why our website does not look quite like as a um, portfolio type of uh, presentation, but uh, we are not only working as architects, but we are also uh, event organizers. We work uh, with um, different organizations. We help and support the creative field. That's what Sneaky was talking about. Our social reactor platform, the Bruno Design Days that I'm a founder of. And uh, we are quite multifunctional in the, in the way we, we started. Uh, we created the first, uh, our first project was an uh, old uh, factory. Let's see if I find it here, the distillery which we kind of took care of as a um, self-starting initiator uh, without any funding and any kind of uh, support or investment. We built it on uh, with our own hands. I don't know if you guys know about our work, um, but this is our starting project that defined a lot uh, who we are and what we are, um, what we believe in. Uh, I think one of our mottos is really to try and make a um, better quality of life in the cities and in the urban environment we are in. And we did this, uh, the, the way we worked was really hands-on, just putting together our uh, ideas, our strength and the community around us. Um, the way i um, shifting into the topic of, uh, of plants, can you see this uh, foldering? Yeah. Um, 
I want to bring you in first in this beautiful place that I was like uh, 15 minutes ago. It's a gorgeous um, serra, it's called in Italian. In English is um, oh, this um, green uh, uh, greenhouse, uh, which uh, the girls founders, there are a bunch of uh, very creative uh, girls that turned the greenhouse into uh, almost like a living space where you can uh, go there and uh, there are events running, there are um, all sorts of, there is a cafeteria, a bar, but it's not, it's not pushed. You're like, uh, you've, you're coming into the space and you feel somehow that you've always been part of it. Nobody asks you anything, you're really welcome, welcomed inside the space just by, by the plants and the, the way it's, um, it's being made. And I thought to show it to you because it's very fitting to, to our topic. Uh, the way we started to work with plants, um, I have to say, was very decorative. Uh, we did not know the topic at all, at all. A few years ago when we started, like five years, five years ago, uh, we started to introduce plants into our projects in a very uh, minimal, or minimum, way with very few um, very few plants and very dec decorative uh, style and I think we started slowly to become a little bit more um, courageous about using them and kind of uh, convincing the clients to uh, to bring it in not only as a decorative uh, element but as part of the space and the, um, the way of leaving it. This is grounds. It's a roastery in the city center of, or new city center of Prague, Karlin, um, where we created this uh, ring of uh, different plants, which is uh, surrounding the higher floor of this um, double height uh, space. And it's, it's, this is like, Last year, um, the, the plants were quite small and right now they're really, really um, big and they became a really important part of, uh, of the space. And what is beautiful about the use of so many plants inside the interior is that, like personally, I have the feeling that uh, the interior becomes alive on its own and um, it has its own character and its own uh, personal personality and life. And this is something that I would say it's really unpredictable. It also, there's so much you can do uh, with it. It's like uncontrollable. Um, after working with grounds, there's something else I wanna show you. This is another uh, project where we started to work with greenery in relation with the public space and um, the urbanism. So we grew bigger, we started to work with, uh, with bigger projects. And Dada District is um, adaptive reuse of an old uh, industry turned into loft and residential block. And what we did is like uh, connecting the building to, towards um, the water and the bike lane around it. And the fact that, that the way of thinking of um, architecture, not just for the building itself, but how do you relate it to the surrounding nature and how you use something that is already existing there, you kind of implement it as part of your project. And another quite um, wonderful um, thing about this project is the rooftop. Now the picture I have, it's also a little bit uh, old, but this is the, um, the roof, which is, um, green roof, which is filtering the water. And what is wonderful about it, not only the rainwater management uh, system, but also the fact that it's a shared space. And um, people in the community living in the space, they are um, uh, using it and they're planting there and they are together through the greenery and through the plants, they are uh, building on the the relationship of the community within the building. So that's also really wonderful, I think, uh, think about nature and uh, how 
how living with nature, with even within a very small amount, can really not only benefit to your, you know, well-being and uh, air circulation and filtering, but it's also a way to connect with uh, with the people around you. Okay, so last thing I want to show you that is not um, is not directly uh, having plants or greenery into it, but I would say this project Circoero, it's um, it's an installation of uh, for public space. But the way that we uh, work with it, especially during the day, it's very much inspired by uh, trees. Um, the ring, which is uh, surrounded, surrounding the installation, it's uh, 14 meters of uh, depth and it's uh, four meters in height. And it works almost like the, the head of a, of a tree because it's creating a, a shadow and the people which are there spending the day, this project was made in Spain. You see that it creates kind of like a, um, uh, like a ring of shadow in, in, in the public space and it's giving the opportunity for people to, to sit under it and enjoy a public space that otherwise would be overheated and really uncomfortable to, to stay in. So something else like um, as a note, not only to, but maybe sometimes you cannot integrate directly uh, plants and greenery inside the public spaces, but you can get inspired, I think, from the way nature works into, into your projects. So that's my final note. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, our next guest is uh, uh, another awesome woman, the co-founder of uh, Henke Botanical Lab uh, in Prague, uh, Alexandra uh, Strelcova. Hello. So it was really interesting, Alex. Um, I didn't know many of the things that, I actually did know a lot of things that obviously I know your work. But I didn't know many of the things that you were describing that are super interesting. And, um, and I might actually follow up on that and put things in a little bit of context because I uh, also- For sure you would. <laughs> <laughs> I also had like a half an hour to prepare. Um, however, uh, I hope it will at least, um, you know, help contextualize a little bit um, um, the world of plants. What you can see here, I mean, uh, this was our first project actually four years ago, exactly four years ago, where we put like, um, uh, you know, around 1000 plants in these frames and white, white um, uh, frames in the National Theater uh, Plaza in Prague, which is basically a space where people only pass by, you know, it's in the center of Prague. Um, it's like super gray, um, all around is uh, you know, surrounded by amazing architecture, you know, one of the hidden, like, not actually hidden gems, one of the gems of Prague's architecture, the brutal uh, Nova Sena building and obviously the National Theatre building. This uh, brutally changed the actual way how people were perceiving um, the space. So all of a sudden when we installed uh, the thing, it took around a couple of hours. Once we started installing the frames, all of a sudden we realized that people were basically stopping by and they all of a sudden were, you know, sitting down or uh, throughout the month that uh, the installation was there, it was called Victoria Pragensis. Um, we realized that people were sitting down, they had meetings there, you know, and they were actually observing the plants, they were learning about them. And somehow it kind of, you know, created this buzz um, also through the topic of what greenery wants, what, what greenery means in um, public space, which is also, by the way, what we wanted. So that's, that's great. Um, also, I have to mention that it was designed by Juraj Lasovsky, an, an architect who uh, is our friend, lives in, in, in Denmark right now. Uh, but so this is how we started, and I'm just not going to, um, you know, bother you with like many of these, um, the projects, but, um, for those who kind of aren't aware of what we do, uh, our mission is really to kind of, you know, 
pick out topics that are related to plants and their uses in our daily lives from, I don't know, anything, architecture, fashion, medicine, design, you know, you name it, food as well. And then basically put them into another context and kind of um, introduce all the amazing functions and uses and, you know, historical connotations that plants have uh, and introduce them to people who, you know, predominantly live in cities, obviously, who might be aware of um, plants, you know, who maybe have a plant or two or maybe a couple of hundreds as it happens in their homes, but also they um, are vivid um, fans of medicinal plants, etc. So, you know, we try to like bring it to another perspective and show um, how amazing plants can be, what it can actually, um, what they can bring also in terms of like innovations, etc. And obviously, you know, work with that, work with communities a lot. Um, so we do a lot of, um, talks and installations like that uh, a few years ago, actually, this was in Brno. I think my talk really is about like a lot of concepts that are related to the use of plants in, in indoor space mainly. Um, this thing was uh, called plant lover, actually, hashtag plant lover. And we recreated this sort of um, living room of a, you know, no name, a house plant lover um, in a gallery in, in Brno. The argument was that, you know, around the time there were a lot of, um, uh, a lot of articles, especially in like the US kind of UK media that were talking about how people turn to house plants because, you know, they basically postpone kids, they postpone marriages because they can't really afford it. And, you know, uh, pets are also quite expensive right now, especially when you live in cities like New York or London. And there's not enough greenery in terms of public spaces. So people just go buy some house plants and then, you know, these are the new pets and these are the new kids because uh, basically they're like, they can't really afford anything else um, uh, in their lives. So we kind of like, you know, brought that to, um, to Brno. Um, and, to, you know, with this project, we kind of asked also people uh, around Czech Republic, you know, and to kind of like corroborate or obviously you know, work with the hypothesis as well, like whether this um, argument could be also valid in, in the Czech Republic, obviously it was not really that valid. Um, gentrification is a problem as well in, in, in cities uh, around Czech Republic, but I guess it's not such a big phenomenon such as in cities, you know, such as New York or London. However, it did kind of, med you know, um, quite a lot of lovely insight into the lives of people who are around 20, you know, to 30 and who have a lot of plants and you know, they kind of um, obviously live with them. They're surrounded by them at home, um, but they're also surrounded them in, in the offices. I'll go back to that later. Um, another thing which we do a lot, quite a lot actually, so we work with a lot of communities. So like from refugee camps to um, nursery care homes, you know, we do like a lot of projects that are basically uh, aimed at bringing greenery to places where, uh, you know, there are disadvantaged communities that don't have really access to nature, to greenery indoors. Um, and uh, so we try to do that. Uh, yeah, this used to be our plant shop in, uh, in Prague, Shishkov Quarter. Uh, we decided not to continue with, uh, with the plant shop because, you know, to be fair, we don't really want to be defined by the plant shop. Business was going really well, but we kind of thought it might be time to dedicate um, to other things. Um, but, um, you know, there is a lot of things that, yeah, like all in all in our work, we do a lot of things around indoor and plants. Um, my favorite, uh, or one of my favorite authors, Oliver Sacks, said in one of his articles, I think, that uh, music and gardens and musical greenery are like one of the two things that uh, he's seen and he's got evidence that are something that is not pharmaceutical, but, you know, it does help people kind of relieve their, their, their stress or their mental health issues. Obviously, if you are suffering from mental health issues, you can obviously turn to plants, but you should also try consulting a professional, by the way. But um, some of those um, concepts, I think it would be nice to, uh, you know, just like briefly go through, because I thought, and I find them really interesting, you know, biophila is one of them. So you've got uh, Edward R. Wilson, 
who in 1984, coincidence, I don't think so, published a book called Biophilia in which he kind of articulates that uh, uh, he says that biophilia is the innate tendency to focus on life and lifelike processes, basically meaning that people or like humankind is destined to love or to be around nature, you know, and it kind of all evolves around nature anyway, because we come from nature. And even though we kind of did um, build cities, um, you know, we're still kind of innately or naturally inclined to, uh, to greenery, obviously, I'm pretty sure you guys might, you know, are pretty aware or are, are even working with biophilic design. Um, I think what is more interesting is whether, you know, that kind of translates or like in what context that kind of translates to, um, to office spaces, which I kind of thought was the um, uh, topic, <laughs> the main topic of today's talk. So there are a few concepts or leads you know maybe obviously um you may have heard of the nasa clean air study which was also done in i think in the 80s or at the end of the 1980s where nasa basically was studying a few plant species and um the the, the outcome was that there are indeed a few plant species that uh can uh, indeed uh, absorb some uh, of the negative uh, ingredients that uh, the air has or indoor air has. Obviously, this was then used by, uh, um, you know, the, the growers all around the world, especially in Holland and, and, um, and you know, in like the, the biggest powers in terms of uh, growing houseplants or, you know, flowers in general, because that kind of, you know, gave them an excuse to sell even more. Although, you know, currently, yeah, there is still a lot of talk about whether that study is actually valid because, well, for one thing, it was done in vacuum. So, um, you know, later studies kind of did indeed say, well, yeah, the plants, they kind of clean air, but at the same time, they, if you want your plants to clean your air indoors, like really you would probably have to have like 10,000 plants per square meter. So it's probably not going to be really um, possible. So I think uh, what is more important and also for us, you know, from our own experience, from our own work is kind of more that psychological, mental health uh, kind of angle whereby plants really do uh, <laughs> make you happier or make the, the, the environment where you work happier. And I think obviously, you know, one possibility could be that kind of biophilic inclination, you know, to all things green, etc. Obviously, there is many um, studies or many approaches that kind of say why that is. But I think basically, yes, this is something that, you know, people kind of, people have been always inclined to, you know, having nature around them and kind of um, taking care of that nature, you know, even if it's um, a small pot with one uh, small plant. Um, I haven't seen many people who, um, uh, you know, if you give them this plan and you put them in, um, in, on their desk, they will take care of it no matter what, because, you know, it's a piece of nature. Uh, before I wrap up, I think uh, what we have been really, what we have been really uh, noticing in obviously COVID uh, era is that many people obviously stayed home in the first wave and they kind of started uh, not only taking up bread uh, making classes, but also, um, you know, their houseplant collection did um, and was enlarged uh, quite a lot. So, um, and I also think this has uh, many things to do with not only their work environment, because obviously homes have become offices, um, but, um, but also the mental health kind of um, angle where, um, you know, people kind of naturally felt like they had to surround themselves with more plants. Yeah, obviously memes came um, shortly after that and the internet reacted. Uh, yeah, I think I'm not going to bother you with history, but basically, you know, you have like all this kind of urban jungle Instagram aesthetics where, you know, you share pictures of your monster on Monday, etc. and you know, there is a lot of, um, a lot of, the community is really, really big, I think. Um, also, 
quite inclusive. Uh, before I wrap up, I think I uh, wanted to just talk about future trends, which are really interesting because I think, um, you know, it kind of goes two ways. I think that in terms of, I'm going to stop sharing anyway, because um, I think in terms of plants in interiors, not many people have actually started to using it anyway, you know, like I haven't, there obviously is like, if you go on design uh, media, et cetera, you will see plenty of uh, example how plants are, are um, put in like the, the projects as well. But I don't think that the, the topic has found a way into like mainstream discourse. So I think there's a lot of work uh, on that as well. Um, and in terms of kind of where the community is heading or where the trends are heading, I think because plants are obviously notorious for uh, their non ability to maintain or, you know, like they're like pretty, you know, they, you have to maintain them, you have to take care of them, you, or you have to hire somebody to take care of them. So, um, you know, there are these like four plants and, and again, like the trend is uh, coming again uh, from the 90s where people kind of figured out after all the boom in 70s people figured out that uh, oh we have to really kind of take care of the plants so it takes money and you know and, and effort and time etc so I think that the four plant kind of trend is coming again and on the other hand obviously sustainability and this kind of like you know eco-friendly thinking is entering this kind of um, industry as well because at least from my experience I'm always really amazed how uh, full of contrast the industry is on one hand obviously you know you are like bringing greenery into spaces but on the other hand it's basically basically depleting the ecosystem and there are obviously a lot of troubles and issues around like how plants are grown um etc i'm gonna go like that deep into it but anyway i think so yeah so like these two future future trends that i can definitely see that we might be you know um, um having more discussions in the future about whether uh, which which kind of way we should go um, but yeah so these are my um, musings um, but yeah thanks thank you thank you sasha for the the things to think about we are um, uh, re regarding plants in the office um, we have quite a lot of plants in the office and uh, I cannot put my finger on if it's uh, uh, helping or not but I was just thinking about it and looking at Nikki behind her she we have a wall full of, uh, of plants that uh, she takes care of uh, most of the time or all of the time and I don't know if they directly impact you, but I have a feeling that they are like a, kind of like a positive person in the room all the time. You know, so no matter if you're in a bad mood or whatever is the vibe, the plants are just there always happy. You know, they need you to take <laughs> yeah. care of them, but they're always like there and fresh and green and growing. So they're giving you like a um, kind of like a positive uh, spin on the day you don't notice them but they're around and they're happy you know they're not uh, objects objects don't have any like a uh, reaction whatsoever but I think that's something I don't think it cannot be scientifically kind of proven maybe but they have this um, <laughs> inner character of positiveness but that's just my maybe full of sun uh, <laughs> brain <laughs> thinking about it what do you think you could like you could like um you know because in my my background is in music or in culture and i can you know there are definitely definitely a lot of like you know things that plants or nature and culture have in common and this being said is like they kind of stir emotions you know like you listen to music and it kind of it gives you vibes you know but you look at and you look in um at a plant and it also kind of like provokes something in you you know what i mean so it's not a, a stoned talk you think it makes sense <laughs> my uh last minute guest is uh, michael matlon the place and architecture psychologist and he helps to create cities and uh, places based on uh, scientific knowledge so people can be happy in them and maybe he will answer your uh, questions so
Hi, my name is Michael Matlon and I work with psychology of architecture. And that means um, using knowledge about the human mind to help create places and spaces that um, improve people's well-being. Um, I also work at the Living Core in Vienna, which is a, um, an innovation consultancy focused on supporting radical and meaningful innovations through transforming um, organizations, culture, strategy, people, and spaces. And we also work with architects, real estate developers, and municipalities on um, understanding the people and places uh, they are going to serve and then creative and innovative plans and developments that, that serve those people. Um, and I also run the Venetian Letter, which is a newsletter focused on um, human-oriented and evidence-based architecture, which we founded together with um, doctor and neuroscientist uh, Natalia Olszewska. Um, and today I'm going to give you a, a little sneak peek, sneak peek into um, biophilia. So the question is, what is biophilia? Um, it's a scientific theory that was popularized somewhere around the 70s. And one of the earliest kind of popular studies is Rogers Ulbricht study, where um, the team looked at a hospital in Pennsylvania and took patients data from two groups of patients. Uh, both groups were recovering from gallbladder surgery um, at the, during, I think, eight years or so in the hospital. Um, but one group was recovering um, in a room with a view of a nearby park. And the other group was recovering in a room with a window view of another wall of the hospital facade. And when they took all these patients' data, they took patients that matched together and so that um, all the other variables would be accounted for. And what they found is that actually the patients that recovered with a room with a view of nature recovered about uh, a day faster uh, than the others with the view of the wall. And they also took significantly less pain medication. So this was a study that kind of uh, started uh, the whole thing and, and popularized it. But since then, already quite a lot of research um, was, was done in this area, especially with the new methods that we can do now uh, in terms of neuroscience and, and digital measurement. And the research so, show, um, so far uh, shows that nature can basically help, uh, help us with uh, three things. And this is uh, mental and physical health. So for example, it can decrease our levels of stress. It can also increase our mental performance, uh, such as memory or attention, and improve our creativity. And it can also improve our uh, mood and help us elicit feelings of beauty when we use nature and natural principles in our designs. Um, for example, this is a, a screenshot from a very interesting report that I think we can then link under the video. Um, and the report analyzed 83 studies about the positive effects of nature um, and natural principles, biophilic principles implemented into um, the design. And they created a very nice, simple and practical overview of um, how we can use these principles in design. And they came up with about 14 different ways, 14 patterns of biophilic design, that's the name of the report, of how we can uh, use nature to benefit uh, people in design. And the next question is probably, so why do we um, benefit from nature? Uh, and for that, we can look into our history, into our evolution. So the human species developed over hundreds of thousands, uh, even millions of years in certain environments. And during our evolution, what evolution does is that basically the organism that develops in it, it gets kind of built around the environment in which uh, the organism develops. So we have been built around nature. Our brains, our bodies are tailor-made tailor 
uh, for nature. And this is why basically, although our brains and our bodies have stayed the same for the last 200,000 years, uh, but our lifestyle has changed dramatically. We have moved from nature to cities to vastly different environments, and we spend about 90% of our times inside. And this is where the trouble comes. So this is also why it's important to look at nature and derive the principles that we can use in design to kind of get back in touch with it. For example, when you look at this picture of an African jungle, you can see that uh, nature has many different qualities that our brains and our bodies react to when we are there. Um, and it's not just plants, it's not just trees that you can see there, but it's also many other things such as the water, which you can not just see, but you can also hear it, you can smell it, you can touch it. Um, you can see different kinds of light. Uh, you can be in a shadow in a direct sunlight. You can see sunlight that goes through the canopies of the trees. Uh, you can also hear many other sounds like um, birds chirping. Um, and you can also feel different um, cha you know, changes in temperature of the environment that is there. So it's really like a multi-sensory um, experience. And this is a picture of an African savanna uh, where we moved uh, when we were already kind of shaping up as human beings. And here, um, apart from all the other uh, qualities that we saw in the previous picture, you can also see uh, some other qualities, some different types of spaces, which we can find in, um, in, in this picture. For example, you can see a hill on which you can climb and you can observe what is happening around you, uh, where are predators, where is water or other resources. You can also use the trees or bushes uh, for protection and, and privacy. This is also called uh, prospect and refuge theory. And so we can really learn a lot from nature uh, for design and it kind of all fits nicely with the evidence from research that we have, such as these 83 studies that are mentioned in the, in the report. And so what is the goal of biophilia is basically taking ourselves, taking our brains and building cities in a way that those brains will not feel like in a city, in an environment uh, which maybe it's a bit difficult for understand for them and stressful, but building these cities in a way that they will feel like in their natural environment, although they will still be in a city. And so next question is, of course, how to do this. So due to time limitations, I just picked a few principles that I will illustrate. But as I mentioned, there are about 14 different ways of, of implementing biophilic design in whatever we do. And, and this is also an important thing to keep in mind that um, these principles do not just apply to landscape design um, or to <clears throat> building you know, parks and, and these kind of natural spaces. These principles can be applied everywhere in design. So whether designing a building's facade, uh, whether picking furniture for interiors uh, or types of lights for interior or exterior spaces, as we will see. So the first and the most obvious principle is just bringing nature to spaces and places. And this is kind of self-explanatory. There's a lot of research that shows that this really has beneficial effects. Uh, spending time in nature uh, can really improve our creativity. It can calm us down. It can even refresh our attention because in nature, in natural spaces, we use a different kind of attention that actually restores our attentive capacities. Then when we go kind of a, a level further, um, we can see that another principle is using natural materials. Uh, and this is a principle that you can use in any decision that you, you do during design. Uh, for example, there are studies which show that our interaction with wood, especially when it's the wood in this natural form, so we can see all those kind of shapes and curves and we can also feel it and touch it. 
um, can calm us down. It can decrease our heart rate. It can decrease our stress levels. Um, and you can use many different materials such as wood, stone, cork, different types of grasses um, and so on. Um, another principle would be using natural patterns and textures. So when you look at nature and, and when you remember the pictures that we looked at before, you can see that nature visually is a very complex uh, experience. It's a, it's a visually complex environment. However, it's not complex chaotically uh, because usually the patterns that we find in nature, the geometry, is um, organized according to certain principles because of how things you know, grow, how things develop. Um, you have probably heard about fractals. Um, you have probably uh, heard about the golden ratio. So these are all pr the principles uh, around which the natural geometry is organized. And it, it's also, there's also a term for that in biophilic design, and it's called organized complexity. Uh, and we need to get much more of this kind of geometry uh, into our designs, into our buildings. So what we did for the last hundred years is that um, a lot of the modernist architecture that we had basically got rid of all of this. They got rid of all the details of all the, or, all, um, all the ornamentation um, and all the kind of natural geometry that was there. Uh, and now we see from research that this is something that would be really beneficial to people and that it actually also influences how people, how much people like the spaces. So people usually find uh, spaces beautiful when they provide them with this organized complexity in their geometry. But this is not just something that we can get inspired by um, in two dimensions, such as when picking a wallpaper for a, a wall or a material for a curtain, but we can also think in 3D. So the same principles apply when we are designing things such as staircase railings, or when we are picking um, the shape of our chairs uh, or tables that we are selecting for our interiors. Another element is water. Uh, so water is one of the most basic things that we need for survival. And uh, it seems that our brains react quite positively to it. Uh, at least when it's not a way, you know, a tsunami wave <laughs> going our way. Uh, but again, as I mentioned before, water is something that we can see, that we can touch, that we can feel, that can help us with regulating temperature uh, in, in the given place. So this is something that we should strive to, to implement into our designs as often as possible. Another dimension would be light. Um, and here I have two examples. So on the left side is uh, a picture of a light coming through tree canopies, uh, which is light that we usually encounter when we wander through nature, like through um, a forest. But at the same time, it's, it's a, a type of light that we encounter uh, quite rarely, in, um, especially in interiors such as offices. And so we should take a look um, at, at how light behaves in nature and then try to simulate it also in the spaces that we create. And on the right side is another, another example of how we, we can use these biophilic principles to design our city streets better in terms of light. Um, and this is because in the recent years, especially for technical reasons. We have started using uh, LED lights, which often have quite cold light, um, a lot of, uh, you know, blue, a lot of blue spectrum in, in it. Uh, and research shows, and you've probably read about this um, in terms of, um, you know, you shouldn't look in, into a mobile phone before you go to sleep, or you shouldn't watch TV because uh, then the blue light uh, disrupts our circadian rhythms. It, it, it makes our sleep worse. And so this is something that we should really think about our streets, uh, where the street lights accompany us during the evening, sometimes even, you know, they, they shine inside. And so we should really strive to uh, use street lights, which have warm light. Uh, so this kind of yellow orange light with a reduced blue frequencies. 
And here are just some examples of how all of these principles or multiple of these principles can come together. Um, so this is an office from, from my previous job at, at, at HV Revis, um, and this is an office in London, where you can see many of these principles being implemented uh, from plants, natural materials, uh, natural colors and patterns and shapes, um, and also different types of spaces, uh, depending on how much you want to focus on or be covered around yourself or maybe observe more openly what is happening around you. This is a office in Japan where you can again see that it's not just the plants that they brought there, but where they really thought about the natural uh, geometry like on the wallpaper, on the wall behind, and also the different types of light. Another space here shows uh, also an example of this kind of prospect and refuge theory where you have a certain types of spaces where you can hide and have more privacy, but also observe what is happening around you. And uh, regarding these kind of natural wallpapers here, what is quite interesting uh, is that research shows that even simulated nature uh, can have these positive effects. So we don't have to experience live nature, but it can also be uh, pictures or, or videos of nature that can elicit this positive response in our brain. And then when we take it a level further, uh, so from the interiors to the exteriors and to our streets, um, we can see that there's still a lot of improvement in how we can start designing places which are really uh, good for people and brain friendly. Uh, this is just an example. Um, on the top picture, you can see a train station in a German city, uh, which was destroyed uh, in the war. And afterwards it was uh, replaced by a, a more functional uh, or functionalist uh, station. Uh, and you can see that the difference is quite, uh, quite huge in terms of design. And this is a pattern that was repeated in the, mainly on, in the 20th century through all our cities um, where we have started or where, where we have actually stopped implementing these biophilic principles. And although you know, before the 20th century, uh, the, the builders and the architects rather did it you know, intuitively, now we already have the research which tells us that, that these things are important. Uh, things such as um, ornamentation or a small tiny detail, uh, things such as you know, symmetry and all this kind of natural geometry. So I'm by no means saying that we need to start building buildings which look exactly like the old ones, but we can find a lot of inspiration and use that together with the research that we have to design buildings which are uh, much closer to how our brain understands space. And uh, just as an illustration that this is not just a, a European or a Western European thing, but when you look at traditional architecture or all around the world, you can find the same principles basically um, all um, over and over again. Uh, and this is also an, a, a, a hint which confirms what we know from research that these shapes, patterns, and visual organization of space is somehow very close to how our brain operates. So what I would like to encourage you uh, to <laughs> is to build nature. And that doesn't just mean building parks and planting trees, which is very important still, uh, but also, as we've seen in this presentation, to really understand these biophilic principles and how to apply them into every design decision that we make, whether it's a landscape, city street, facade, interior, um, furniture design, anything. And I would also like to invite you uh, to connect on LinkedIn, uh, where I'm also sharing quite a lot of different and interesting articles, new research, things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'm really happy that I'm uh, surrounded uh, by lots of uh, architects uh, here uh, in the office because uh, 
this is kind of thing I uh, definitely uh, play them, uh, especially our interns. <laughs> uh, quite uh, nice uh, material. So thank you very much, and I'm happy that you you uh, managed to be here with us. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. And yeah, I'll be definitely happy to then connect with all of you and you know explore what what we do. And... So and now the last uh, participant uh, uh, is uh, Ivo Borkovic, uh, the architect and co-founder of uh, Yeju Studio uh, from Poland. And I asked him to tell us uh, something uh, more about uh, their inter interdisciplinary projects, not just architecture, but uh, it's uh, up to you, Ivo, to tell us what you prepared. Hey everybody, uh, nice to be here with you. Uh, yes, my name is Timo. Um, I'm half of uh, Yeju Studio or Jiju Studio, however you please. And um, uh, we started with architecture as a studio, um, but we're more and more morphing into uh, different ways of working with space in general. Uh, so today I'm going to talk mostly about uh, my sculptural work, which talks a lot about, often about our relation to nature in general. Um, maybe it's not going to be as informative uh, as, as the previous one, uh, but it, maybe it's good to balance it with a little bit more subjective observations. Um, so to start, share screen probably would be a good place. Um, so. I did, I will mention one project that we did that was driven a lot by nature. So we are building a school in uh, Tanzania and a refugee settlement. And there is a couple of things that we wanted to touch upon with that project. But one of them is the, the relation to nature that the local community has. Uh, when they were moved into that area, it was actually a forest reserve. Uh, but now, as you can see on the map here and on the pictures, uh, there is really not a lot of trees left. And it was a dense forest just in 1970s. Uh, so one of the most uh, important issues for us was uh, the temperature in the classroom and the relation to greenery and both of them were addressed by placing uh, the classrooms near uh, the group of mango trees that we found on the plots that we could use uh, and we actually decided to wrap the school around the tree uh, to kind of protect it uh, but also put it in the center and uh, cherish it again but the tree gives back because it creates a canopy cools down the air which then enters the classroom and continuously cools down the building with the um, help of geometry of the roofs that are uh, lifting upwards so the hot air escapes outside sucking in the cold air from underneath the tree uh, and hopefully this um, will kind of put the, the help them understand that the greenery around them is going to help them a lot as they're highly uh, potent to droughts and water shortages and very very high temperatures in the summer and when I was there for the first time they actually were just about to cut one of those three mango trees because they just needed some wood for cooking uh, so I managed to convince them to, to, to maybe let us keep them uh, we're in the middle of a construction now <clears throat> uh, half of the school is built and the trees are alive. We are a bit afraid about foundations and roots, but managed to uh, precisely position the building so, so the trees are, are well and uh, already create this big uh, shadowy space in the middle of the school. Uh, so this, uh, I think I'm gonna not talk about architecture any more than this, but uh, I'm gonna talk about a couple of sculpture projects. So my sculpture project started with this, um, which uh, talks about our relation to climate and to nature in general. These are totems, these, uh, these are wooden uh, uh, forms that are hand painted in a collaboration with Alicia Biala, the artist, and they are actually uh, representing statistical data uh, about our relation to climate. So each one talks about a different topic. This is a to totem about deforestation. This is about the quality of air, uh, overfishing, wildlife, and these colorful uh, elements represent the proportions from the graphs uh, from that research. For example, uh, this one is the total amount of uh, wild animals living on the planet 50 years ago, and the green part is just the part that is still alive today. And each one of them talks about 
uh, a different so, uh, environmental topic. Uh, but this was my gateway into sculptural world, uh, the public sculpture objects. Uh, and the next one I'm going to show you is more uh, connected to the topic of today's meeting, which uh, <clears throat> is uh, the project called Long Live the Pal. Um, I was invited for um, artistic residency in Agda, Portugal, and um, I was building actually some more totem sculptures in Portugal and uh, then stayed a little bit longer and they asked me uh, on the phone when I was getting there, if oh, there's a couple of things in the city that you could be interested in uh, to look at. And one of the things, for example, we had this beautiful square in the middle of town, which everybody cherishes a lot. It's next to the river. It's this place where everybody hangs out for like uh, a dinner or, or, a, or, or, a con or a music concert. Uh, it's our proud public space. And we have these five palm trees there. And now two of them are dead and three are dying because of a uh, they got in, uh, attacked by a beetle that a larvae of eats the palm uh, from the inside out. <clears throat> and I said, yeah, it's an interesting topic, but I didn't know, uh, I, didn't, I didn't say we want to do it. But the second day I arrived there, turns out I had a booked meeting with the mayor of the city to, pro to show my proposal. When I was like, uh, it totally wasn't, it did not exist. Uh, but I, of course, went to the meeting and said, yeah, we're looking into it. So we'll see what's up. Uh, <clears throat> and then invited another artist and we started working, asking ourselves what to do with, with the palm trees. Um, and we, were, we had different ideas and it took us a couple of weeks to, to develop that idea. Uh, but every week I was getting phone calls from the mayor's office and he was like, uh, Ivo, do you know, are you going to cut them? Are you not going to cut them? Because we have people coming into the uh, mayor's office and, and like complaining that this looks bad, this is not representative and showing how much discomfort a dead tree is causing to a person. And the whole project started to be this story about how uncomfortable we are with pieces of nature. Everybody here, as three presentations before we passed, said that people love nature. Everybody loves nature. But is it true? What do you mean by nature? Nature is a circular thing needs to die and decompose, to feed the new, to grow, and then again blossom and be green or colorful or vertical. But when we say we love nature, it seems we're actually very picky about which moments of that circle we're happy with. We like when it's green, we like when it's blossoming, but when it's dirty, dry, broken, smelly, we hide it, we clean it, we go to the mayor's office and complain about it. So our project was an attempt of um, giving these un unwanted parts of nature some kind of a form uh, that would also allow them to be considered beautiful. And in order through that, highlight their importance uh, as there is no blossoming without um, falling apart and, and rotting. So we took the palm trees, chopped them into wood chips, composted them, mixed with local soil and seeds of local plants. And on the opposite side of the river, rebuilt the five palm trees by uh, round earth te uh, technique. So we created these, these, these palm uh, poles uh, that had the had palm trees in them, the soil and the seeds to allow them to fall apart, feed the new and create new life. The other side of the river is much wilder than the city part. So they're standing in the wild environment and plants are growing out of them and they are spreading seeds around. And you can pass by every week for a walk and see how they decompose. And uh, we also really like this idea of, of actually taming the decomposition. The, the, it brings it, especially to us, it was pretty obvious when we saw them first of them cracking and falling apart, how, how difficult for us is to, to, to accept things falling apart, the, the materiality of things being temporary. But everything is temporary. Everything falls apart quicker or later, uh, sooner or later. Uh, so it, this, this also tries to, uh, give the viewer a chance to, to kind of get comfortable with that. 
so the, the plants are growing out of the sculptures, uh, the sculpture cracks, it falls apart, and then new seeds that were deeper get some sun and water, and they wake up and, and grow again. And this continues until the sculptures will totally disappear, just spread the seeds around the landscape and become the landscape itself again. So this is one and a half year later now. The sculptures are growing, they're spreading seeds. You can even see that they're growing vegetables. So some of my Portuguese friends send me pictures from dinners that they cooked from the vegetables that actually grew from the sculptures themselves. Uh, we actually stuck with the, with the soil uh, elements a bit longer. And now we're looking into uh, how material, like how matter moves in the ecosystem, uh, even uh, in the non-living uh, matter. Uh, we recently built this, this pavilion out of soil that was taken exactly from the place where it was built to kind of <clears throat> emphasize the fact uh, of uh, the matter uh, always coming from somewhere, uh, looking at the fact that we often see buildings, but we do not think of where the whole, where the materials we're taken from is so we have a pile of sand but where is the hole we have a phone in our pocket we have a bottle in our hand somewhere they're not so everything has its own hole that it came from so we create a big dagger hole and with that soil build a pavilion to talk about uh these circulation of matter through the festival invited a lot of uh, artists that inhabited the pavilion for 48 hours each and uh talked about uh, the related issues to uh, earth, dirt, land ownership, and our relation to, to, to the planet. Um, for example, this project con uh, focused on plants a little bit. It was a plant shop where the artist uh, collected plants from plots within the city that were already sold to be developed as a new uh, commercial housing projects. And she knew that soon the construction site is gonna open. So she went to those plots and kind of saved the plants that were there from being run over with uh, the trucks. And then she uh, labeled all of them, wrote what kind of qualities they have. Is it medicinal? Does it, does it smell nice? Or, and then for two days, uh, the pavilion was a plant shop where you could uh, adopt um, uh, all of these plants and take them home. And at the end, uh, the last day of the festival, we invited people from the festival to collapse the whole thing, level it down with absolutely no uh, kind of leftover material. It just was zero, minus one, plus one, and then zero again uh, to highlight this closed circle of circulation of matter in nature. So yeah, um, that's 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 what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, as this is just a small fraction of what we do, the, the sculptural work, but uh, I, I was uh, asked to share this one with you. So uh, for more, we need to meet some other time and talk about different things. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, sorry, I asked about this project because I really like it. <laughs> thank you. Do you have uh, any questions on the reaction or on to anybody uh, who speak here today? I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm just super happy that I could take part of this like so much. Um, super interesting stuff. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Let me thank ask you. a question uh, to actually to Michal. Uh, are if I understand correctly, you're not an architect, you or are you an architect? Like, uh, I'm a psychologist. You, you're a psychologist, exactly. So I, I'm, I'm very curious to see how the principles you, uh, you briefly uh, like put forward today. I'm very into fact-based design and you're a scientist and you're looking at, looking at data. Uh, but architecture and design in, in general, uh, is hugely influenced by culture. Uh, and uh, when you said that architects used to have these tools to design, for example, facades in a way that were more aligned with uh, the, these ideas you were, you were talking about, 
uh, we did, we, I don't think they did have that kind of, um, they didn't think through the language that you talked to. It, it was pretty intuitive through the ages culturally. We ended up with facades that were aligned with, with this train of thought that you presented. Uh, so there is some kind of uh, a force within the culture that the, uh, I guess evolutionary roads lead us towards to actually align with the, this, this, this approach without being conscious that it's happening. Mm. But I, I guess the modernism kind of uh, actually was trying to be very scientific, like uh, hygienic movement and then a pretty intellectual approach. But in, so I guess in your perception, modernism was anti-scientific, even though it's thought to be much more logical than historical approaches uh, at the time. That, I guess there's this funky contradictions that they thought they were more scientific, but now you're looking at it and saying, yeah, there is science, mm. that their science was wrong. Yeah, I think, that I think that, you know, each, I want to formulate that, in each phase that we saw in the, you know, design movement and, and architecture had its, you know, reasons and, and relevancy at that time, right? So modernism, uh, came after quite a you know huge cultural trauma after World War One, World War Two, um, after a huge population explosion, and so on. And and this this probably led to to what it was, right? There were different priorities, perhaps. Also, as you mentioned, you know there there was a lot gained in terms of. Oh, sorry, my camera turned off. Uh, I think it just overheats sometimes. We can still hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, so there, there were, you know, these advances in hygiene and, and ventilation and uh, also like natural light, you know, big windows and so on. And this is, of course, something that we need to keep. At the same time, as you said, you know, we have gained also certain new knowledge that now shows us through the scientific method that, uh, you know, actually from the psychological point of view, there are certain principles that we should keep in mind when designing. While I think in the, in the modernist movement, there was not much attention paid to these kind of psychological things. So it was more of this like physical science, the, the basic necessities. But, you know, right now, you know, in the Western world, definitely. And I think that uh, more and more people every month, every day are receiving this kind of basic standard of living. Um, so, so I think that as a society, we are now ready to, to uh, move to the next level, which is combining both of, both of these things. So, so creating spaces um, and places which are much more aligned with, with um, how our brains work uh, what people, you know, found, find beautiful, uh, because if, if you look at, you know, what actually people prefer as a, a general population, then you will usually find that the, the, what we would call historical buildings or the ones built before the 20th century are, are much more preferred by people, you know, visually. Uh, so this is something that speaks to them. Uh, and now we even have the scientific evidence that shows us maybe why or how it works. Um, and since technology develops, um, you know, we have 3D printing, all these things. I think that right now is, is a good time to actually start, as you said, you know, uh, returning to these principles a bit, but upgrade them with, with all the new possibilities uh, that we have with the new, support them with the new knowledge and enable them with, with the new technologies. Yeah. Thank you. Ivo, how, how is it, um, how is the public uh, reaction to your project? What is the um, understanding of what you did? Because it's, um, if you don't know the process of this mm. project, it's uh, people just see the final result and uh, do they understand it and how do they react to it? I'm talking about just common every day. <laughs> so uh, I guess you're asking about the one in Portugal, the palm tree story. Uh, and um, exactly. so 
Mm, I think there is a couple of layers to look at it. Like we we know that the story is not self-explanatory when you look at the sculpture itself. Um, but we hope that the sculpture works without the uh, E as well. So you can see an object when you pass by. It's, it's a very common uh, walking route for this, for this town. It's not a big town. It's, it's I think, uh, roughly 18,000 people. And um, so it's a very common route that people take in a weekend to, to, to go to the natural uh, spaces uh, for picnics or swimming in a river uh, or biking. And um, so all of them pass, like all of these people that pass by at the beginning saw these very clean objects in stripes of color uh, that obviously looked designed and, and built by, by men. Uh, and um, then week by week, you see it falling apart, disintegrating and becoming landscape and things growing out of it. And, and this, you come from a very orderly design form into more chaos in nature. And, and um, this process itself is enough for me to, to feel that it can have a, some kind of a reflective quality to a viewer where they need to, they probably have to judge. Are, do they feel comfortable with things falling apart or not? Do they like the fact that it's falling apart? What does it mean for them? Uh, it, there, there is a chance to just uh, confront yourself with uh, the temporality of, of material things. Uh, on the other hand, we also think that, that the story is pretty important for those people with those five palm trees actually having a longer presence in the town because they actually were planted 30, 20 something years back in front of their courthouse and they grew too large and they all decided as a uh, community to move them to the central square next to the river. They actually really cared about these and when we were cutting them down, people came, we, we explained and we created these miniature uh, palm tree uh, seed bombs. Actually, maybe our were actually giant and these were the actual seed bombs. But, and we wrapped them like candy and the, the rap had the whole story in Portuguese written on it. And we created like a couple hundred of these and just went around the city and left them on every doorstep, gave them to every person so they could open the, the, the candy. I think I have a picture somewhere and uh, uh, read the story and then take the, uh, the, the, seed, the, the seed bomb and put it in their garden or, or their uh, a pot at home and see this, the same plants growing out of it at their home and kind of uh, enjoy a miniature uh, version of that story at home as well. So we tried to communicate it as, as uh, accessibly as we could. And even, I hope even for those who didn't get to read that story or hear it from a neighbor, uh, it still can have some kind of an interesting uh, value. Yeah, I think it's a very, very beautiful story. I think it's a very important uh, topic to tackle because uh, we had recently a project of a competition we applied for a public space in uh, outside of Prague and uh, they have a problem of uh, water, mm, rainwater management on the, on the roads and on the squares and they have also a river going through and a flooding issue so the river goes up and it covers everything and uh, the location and they wanted some better communication of the roads and uh, kind of create a square they there's beautiful trees and what we did in our proposal is that we kept the existing trees because they have you know their own qualities and they're kind of like a character of the location, not only that they help with the uh, heat uh, waves and the cooling down and water management, but they're also like a character of the location. And there is a roughness to it. You know, they're not perfect. You know, they're like not placed in the right place. They're not uh, in good shape. You know, they need a maintenance. And um, the proposal that won uh, took them all down and uh, put the trees, new trees, in the place where the, the, it was best fitting for, you know, the new design. 
And for me, this was so, so dramatically wrong, you know, like instead of, you know, like us adapting to nature, we put nature where we want. And by the way, the trees that they will put there will take 30 years until they become what the existing trees uh, are now. So I think the conversation on the beautification of nature and the over perfectionism of uh, our image of how nature should look like and feel like and we can be in, it's super important and uh, it's a really, really huge topic. Sorry, Nikki, we shifted from, <laughs> from <laughs> like a kind of productivity, but it's also productivity of the city. No, it's still the, the topic I... I was asked. But, but it's something that makes me very, very angry and I don't know how to kind of explain it to municipalities and cities and uh, um, yeah, general public or even mm -hmm. architects because the studio that won, they're friends of ours, you know. Yeah, I, I, I've, I also found this, this thought interesting in Evo's presentation. And I think that on one hand, you know, it's, it's kind of understandable that people want uh, to, to pick the best from nature, because even in, in natural environments, some parts of the environments are more, you know, friendly and conductive to life. Uh, so, for example, you know, if, even if you are in a, in, on a savanna and you see an area with a lot of dead plants, then you probably know that something's wrong and you shouldn't really, you know, be there or eat the plants. Uh, so even evolutionarily, this makes sense, I think. But then on the other hand, I think it's important what you mentioned that we still need to understand that nature in order to work well needs those places of, um, you know, death <laughs> or degradation and that we shouldn't just remove them from everywhere because it's then we just have these, you know, football field lawns in development projects where basically no life can, uh, no, no life can happen. So, yeah. I think it's quite interesting. And yeah, and maybe just also for, for your colleagues and or and, and also you, uh, Alex and Evo, it could be interesting. There's this um, organization called uh, the Center for Conscious Design uh, and they are organizing a global festival. Uh, it's called Conscious Cities Festival. I think it's in 30 cities right now and started I mm -hmm. think in London. Um, and it's it's quite quite a nice and and already quite a growing movement of 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 actually using you know scientific evidence to inform design, and there are really people from all sorts of um, industries and areas. So there, there's both architects and scientists and you know sociologists and and cultural people and so on. So that might be also you know interesting. Yeah, that would be super useful. I would love to see more of that. Nick, yeah. if you can sh collect all this information, uh, mm -hmm. uh, please uh, put it together and send it to us. And, I also saw yeah. you have this new newsletter, Michal, mm -hmm. that is really interesting. I would love to be okay. part I can, of that. I can send it to you too. Yeah. And could you maybe just shortly, I don't want to keep you on Friday <laughs> evening, but could you just shortly maybe uh, tell me a bit about what uh, you are aiming for with the social reactor, with, with the, the organization? Uh, maybe Alex is also a co-founder of this, mm -hmm. so uh, she can uh, tell you a little bit more than mm -hmm. I said. Um, I think at the beginning it was uh, a little bit more overall to the to the public and uh, kind of informing. We, we worked a lot on, uh, on design and bringing designers together and creatives uh, as like a, a, a space uh, where sharing ideas. And we started in Brno. Yeah. So we, yeah, we started like a kind of like a gathering and a collective of uh, different people in the fields of design and other architects mm -hmm. and urbanists and so on. Uh, because yeah, I was saying in the know if you know, but not much. But there was no space where creatives can you know communicate together and share mm -hmm. ideas. So it really started like a, a very punk hub of um, of getting together. Now the city started this uh, group. I think it was very inspired also about from our distillery uh, and other projects. 
and they created this uh, Kumst, which is a hub for the creative industries. We're also making a support for the different uh, fields uh, from film industry, gaming, uh, architect designers, mm -hmm. fashion designers, and all sorts of different uh, fields. So our social reactor a little bit more shifted into the field of specifically architecture, urbanism, mm -hmm. uh, engineering, and we're having our own like uh, specialists in the house, uh, be just behind Nikki's wall right now. There's a little um, co-working uh, space of people very much related with our field. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we did that also because of necessities of our architecture studio, where we, we needed to have a closer collaboration with uh, specialists um, than just working within each other, within mm -hmm. the architecture world. So where it's going, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a whole organic uh, kind of growth, um, but we keep it there. It's like our cultural platform uh, and social platform uh, to connect with the people um, around us. And it's great because then, you know, uh, we get to meet with people like you guys and uh, you never know where things mm -hmm. go because we start mm -hmm. collaborating with most of the people that we got in touch with at a certain point there's uh, in the future some uh, possibilities of collaboration on interesting projects, you know, instead of being always in your own little world of uh, people that you already know, you reach out to the world. Mm. Is that answering your question? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it sounds really interesting. And I looked at your website before uh, at the Koga website and, and you have very interesting projects and and then I also looked at this uh, social reactor website and I think there was this kind of motto something along the lines of like changing what is being built um, so I, I like that also and and just the fact that you're also interested you know in these topics that we have had the event around so I think that's very nice and maybe we could you know I'm thinking that maybe we could we could connect also with my colleagues from the living core or maybe with Natalia from the Venetian letter um, maybe there could be something interesting because we work with with architects a lot so uh, and we like to work yeah, on interesting projects yeah. specifically and, and yeah, these kind of meaningful fun. socially beneficial projects so yeah it's this this is what exactly we were focusing on and still are thinking about this what you really nicely worded overly politicizing and over perfect like trying to make nature fit our view of how nature what nature is which is so bizarre and i think Michal, you probably would agree with these that you showed that this picture of the landscape and said that our brains are wired to expect some kind of uh, I guess irregularities and mm. uh, you say about fractals and golden ratio, but nature is also really very chaotic and, and mm, architecture and city building isn't. Mm. I try, it's not trying to be. Uh, mm. So even if you propose just the trees to be placed pretty randomly, mm. already was uncomfortable for people. Mm. It's messy. Imagine we would <laughs> find districts, streets that are counter efficient, but are much closer to our perception to natural landscape. Of course, I'm now talking about absurd things because efficiency will is, is governing stuff now, but maybe there are some areas in design where we can have the chaos without much loss of efficiency uh, and try to see if, if this discomfort is tameable. Mm. Can we at some point achieve a level of calmness when we see something we're not exactly sure about? Mm. Yeah, I think I think it's we will need to learn that through you know trial and error also how to walk the fine line between the 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 organization and the complexity because what people seem to like the most is really this kind of organized complexity where you have complexity and, and you know, chaos, but, but where you can still see some larger patterns behind it. Um, and, and maybe this is, maybe you already lost the audio there, but 
but there was just my comment that on one hand, I think it's 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 really important to bring all kinds of nature just for the sake of you know sustainability to not have it too artificial so that we kill all the insects and all the life there and so on. But on the other hand, it's kind of natural, I think, to to see that people just want to take the best from nature because that's what they are re reacting positively to. That even when you walk through a forest and you see a, a patch with a lot of dead plants, and this is probably not a place that you will want to spend your time in, even if even you know a hundred thousand years ago as a hunter gatherer, because it signals that maybe the water there is not safe to drink, maybe the plants are probably not safe to eat. So we still seek this kind of uh, things, um, and yeah, then it's probably just about balancing it. So how to make it so that people perceive it positively and at the same time it it doesn't destroy the sustainability of the of the place yeah. so thank you and maybe okay. next time in some cooperation yeah thank you see you bye bye nice to bye. You. bye bye, bye. 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 bye.